Access, awareness, affordability, convenience, and culture acceptability. Delivering these changes in the communities in which we work requires knowledge from the people, their interest, in incentives, and it requires knowledge of the health and climate benefits of each of the different solutions that we are going to work. It also requires effective collaboration between different partners among diverse stakeholders, including communities and their leaders, private companies, governments, research organizations, and NGOs. And I'm happy, so happy, to see you all here who brings a wide variety of experiences in this forum. And today, under this track, putting people at the heart of clean cooking, we have speakers from various backgrounds sharing their experiences. People satisfaction is very important to accelerate clean cooking market growth and its sustainability. I can't stop sharing you that practical action in Nepal is working to develop digital applications, not only to disseminate information about cook stoves and fuel, but also to collect feedback through QR code, SMS systems, and interactive voice responses. Please do visit our NDIV MEX booth outside to know more about these applications. When companies are not physically available to go to the customers, we hope that these solutions an application could, could bridge the gap to collect feedback and to improve their solutions. We need more stories from companies, from entrepreneurs, how they are addressing customers' feedback and problem, and how can they leverage digital solutions and innovations moving forward. One of the sessions today will con outline the need for generating insights on consumers to tailor services and products to their needs behaviors and constraints, rather than pushing convenient existing solutions. Maina Tamang also said that access to energy services is very important from farm to plate. Who further said, energy services is necessary not only to cook and consume food, but is equally important to produce, package, preserve, and ultimately to food security. Who was said too. And on my way yesterday from Accra, from Nepal to Accra, I was watching a movie where they were showing stale food was being served to kids under school meal program. Of course, there could be many other external factors, but some questions came to my mind. Where was the food actually cooked? Is it due to unavailability of clean cook fuel? Foods were cooked somewhere else and transported to that school. Were there no refrigerators to cook those meals for the kids and many more? I'm sure not only in India and Nepal, but there are many
Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for choosing this session, uh, among many other very interesting sessions. Really appreciate your presence here. Um, as Jeline was saying, my name is Ivona. I'll be the moderator of the session with this brilliant lineup of um, speakers today, um, which Jeline has already kindly introduced to us. Um, so just to give a little bit of a context in addition to what as uh, the work we do in schools. So when it comes to the humanitarian sector, I think the biggest challenge is uh, to learn how to link food assistance to cooking. Uh, we know that people barter food 
for fuel. You can't eat it if you can't cook it. Cook it. And, and yet, interventions on cooking come later as an afterthought. It's not, food assistant is not yet designed uh, with the cooking component that, that goes with it. So that's uh, uh, something we are trying to influence. It's not easy. Um, because, also because uh, acute emergency, for example, requires uh, immediate uh, response. And uh, that's not something that goes hand in hand with uh, clean cooking. You can't uh, stock a solution in a warehouse uh, and deploy it uh, when uh, uh, the need arises because we know that for cooking, solutions are depending on the context. So each time we find ourselves uh, um, wanting to use uh, development approaches in, in a sector that actually doesn't really allow much for that kind of wiggling. Um, in Chad, for example, we had a, a project uh, that is coming to a conclusion where we did our assessments. So that's a protracted crisis, so it's a bit easier. Um, we did the assessments, uh, we, we looked at what the government wants, uh, what uh, was already available, uh, what uh, the, the beneficiaries actually uh, wanted, and we came up with LPG. Now, is that the best solution? Is it going to be too costly? Uh, we'll be able to tell you with uh, uh, a research that uh, we hope to be publishing next year with uh, the MAX. Um, but, but yeah, it's uh, always a challenge to try and understand <laughs> what kind of uh, uh, solutions to, to take. And I can tell you about the institutional later if uh, you give me the chance. Great, thank you very much, Rafa. On that note, I quickly wanted to go to Juanita. Uh, we're talking about um, solutions, we're talking about preferences. There's also very much that cultural aspect of uh, food, of food preparation, the food culture behind it. And I know that Juanita is very much working on, on that, and um, it would be great if we could hear from you a little bit on that kind of emotional connection and also how to tackle those cultural differences that drive how we produce, how we prepare, cook the food, how that links to energy, um, and how you're addressing that through Crescendo Foods. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, for me, as a food scientist, um, I've been in product development for quite some time. And seeing the changes um, over the last decade or so, and what I've noticed is that, to your point, yes, everyone has an emotional connection to their food. Living here in Ghana, you know, everyone hears about the infamous jollof wars, right? Ghana versus Nigeria versus whoever. Well, in Ghana, it's, it's only Ghana that matters. And it is a very emotional connection. And so when we think about what are we seeing now, and especially with the pandemic that has happened and still ongoing, people are starting to change their focus even more to what's in you know, our food. Maybe I think a little bit becoming a more OCD about it, <laughs> you know, as far as is it clean, what does this look like? And we're also starting to see, as a result, of course, with the pandemic, a lot of people were moving about. So you're seeing these intersectionality of cultures. So if I'm an American, and depending on where I'm from in the US, you know, I am bringing my culture into the Ghana landscape, right, and vice versa. Now, it's great that we're seeing, you know, the expansion of everyone's food onto everyone's plate. What ends up happening, though, is that the voice of where that food comes from, whether it's indigenous, whether it's between from a specific um, country, that gets lost. And then you have cultures who claim that they discovered something that was already in rotation in someone else's culture. And so I think the biggest thing is, is that and then it becomes a big you know, hoopla of who owns what. Who owns the recipe? Who owns the, the, the grain? Who owns, it, the list keeps going and going and that's where the emotions start to become uh, elevated. 
and then you end up losing the story. So I think what's important is that as we are, you know, thinking about how foods are migrating across several different continents or just globally, you know, trying to making sure that we're keeping that record. Um, a phenomenal uh, food anthropologist said, her name was Corsha Wilson, she quoted, the reason why people think French cuisine is, you know, the standards because it's the only one that's been recorded. So think about that. You know, if you have a, um, a recipe from your grandmother to an extent, you know, write it down, you know, so that you can do that. And how we, what we're doing here at Crescendo Foods, we're Ghana's first culinary hub where we are offering commercial kitchen space. And we're getting ready to launch next month. It's, it's exciting but scary at the same time. <laughs> and so how we're doing that is, you know, we're working with chefs, we're working with food businesses, and it's very emotional. People are coming in with how they've been doing something for the last who knows how many years. And you don't, you want to respect the culture, but if they're ma making food for a massive amount of people, you also want to keep in mind how to do it in a clean fashion, whether that's food safety, and then on the flip side of it, talking about clean cooking when it comes to stoves. And that's something that for me as a CEO, I have to think about. What is my, I guess I may be helping communities who are, in, who are in food to be able to feed the masses, but if I'm adding on to climate change, then I'm not as good as anybody else. Right? And so I think that's the thing for, that we have to think about. But also making sure that as people are coming into our space, telling their story to their food, about their food, that we're honoring them and honoring their culture. And being able to give them the space, give them a, a, a seat at the table to be able to tell their story, even if it sounds completely insane sometimes. <laughs> But you still have to honor that person and honor their uh, opportunity to be able to do it in a clean way because now we have no choice. This is not a, oh, okay, we can use gas and we'll just ignore it for another 15 years. We're not at that point anymore. Uh, very wise words. We're not. And hopefully that uh, we'll, we'll see the change over the coming years. And this is just another way to propel it, this conversation, the many that are happening this week. Um, this brings me to you, Alex, um, and following that, we'll touch on the institutional side, which uh, I'm also um, seeing uh, in your work, Juanita. Um, but Alex, you are an entrepreneur, you are a farmer yourself, uh, you work on food security systems in a multi-pronged way. Uh, and I like how you said that Sistema Bio is an agricultural tech company as much as it is an energy company. And perhaps that ag factor is actually more interesting and important because the, of the production of the fertilizer, which propels food production quite significantly. Um, could you tell us about the importance of the work on food security, on resilient food systems that Sistema Bio is contributing, and those local and c circular um, systems that you're trying to promote. Of course, yeah, don't tell the CCA that we're only moonlighting as a clean cooking company, but we're really focused on uh, agriculture and the intersection of, of agriculture and, and energy supply is, I think, probably our sweet spot, but um, we manage uh, a biogas company, so we manufacture uh, anaerobic digesters that are distributed around the world, and one of our differentiators and, and the reason I think we've been able to grow over the last 15 years is because we work very closely with farmers. And one of the early lessons that we learned was that um, farming, like a lot of food production, is hyper-local. So we weren't able to install digesters in central Mexico and then just say, look, it worked here. So when we went to southern Mexico, everyone would just believe us and adopt it. We really had to do a lot of effort uh, in, in each individual community where we worked. So we had to be hyper-aware of, and I, I think Juanita's points about Food is culture, but even more importantly, agriculture is essentially society responding to the local climate, right? So what we grow is really determined by the type of soils and the type of climate that you have. And so food, therefore, is the union between the environment and society in some ways. And so I think that 
piece of clean cooking is maybe sometimes missing here. We have all these beautiful pictures of the stoves, but at the end of the day, what's most important is the deliciousness of the food and the union of sharing a meal. And that's a very deep emotional and cultural connection that really is something that the, the clean cooking industry, I think, can learn a lot from because those emotional connections are what, you know, the, the statistics around health and stuff we find are less effective than showing someone in Chiapas or India or wherever it might be that the, the local dishes that their, their grandparents cooked over an open fire can taste the same um, when it's cooked and being really specific about ingredients, being very specific about how food techniques and listening to farmers. Uh, traditionally, humans have domesticated on the order of about 22,000 different plants and animals and, and food for consumption. But today, we uh, get about 80% of our calories from about six different species. So we've, the, the diversity loss there, I think, is something that is really useful to compare when we look at some of the one-size-fits-all for cooking solutions, because really, it's very important to know how micro adjustments in co cooking habits can really impact health. And so just an interesting statistic for, um, our smallest digesters, we have a, a range of digesters that can process organic waste that creates a clean cooking gas, but we also create this really impactful biofertilizer. And so for every family that we're able to give a sust sustainable supply of clean cooking fuel to, we're also providing about three hectares worth of organic fertilizer every year that could displace all of the, the chemical fertilizer inputs that they're using today. So that union of food and cooking is sounds so natural, but it's actually, there's a reasonably large gap um, in the sectors in the space. The people that are working on agriculture are sometimes unaware of the clean cooking and energy challenges. And, and you also mentioned, don't tell CCA again, but we do more than just clean cooking. We also are providing energy and electricity with biogas. And so we've seen that the, the milling, the refrigeration and, and all of these other energy needs linked to food, linked back to clean cooking, all need to be in the same conversation because we have to be looking holistically at human health. One is the element of the, the challenges that come from poor indoor air quality, but the other is um, really a, a declining soil quality, declining food nutrition, and, and obviously, you know, hunger on one extremity, but also just a uh, lack of balanced, nutritious meals as we lose some of the cultural cuisines that we're used to. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, precisely, this is, this is, I think, a very important point that perhaps gets lost sometimes in conversations about clean cooking and about food security, bridging the gap, but also really thinking about nutrition, thinking about all the parts of the energy system that are required to build something that is resilient, that is adaptable, that is responsive to change, and that secures a nutritious meal every day. Um, and that brings me to nutrition in school feeding, uh, and who better to talk about it than, uh, than you, Rafa. Um, huge challenges in institutional cooking, particularly schools have a huge responsibility to not only educate, but also to feed millions um, of students every day. Um, could you speak to that point of you know, some of those challenges, but some of those opportunities as well, and the, the shift that we're, we're observing that WFP is very much a part of? Thanks. Yeah, in fact, I think there are more opportunities than challenges in uh, institutional cooking. And um, that's because uh, the, the gain is big uh, in related to the effort. So you uh, substitute, substitute one stove and that is going to feed uh, hundreds of children. So it's uh, a, a well-placed type of effort. In WFP, we have the um, opportunity to be present in hundreds, thousands of schools with the school feeding program. So we already bring the food there, and we've been actually, the records are from 2003, we've been um, uh, uh, distributing improved stoves in those schools. Um, the opportunity is to rationalize that kind of intervention that now happens a bit ad hoc, 
but uh, um, the, the, the challenge, and uh, I'm going to quote uh, a study that is being uh, completed that you, Ivona, know very well, um, which is uh, um, this one, the state, the state of access to clean cooking in schools. So we asked the SMAP to help us fill the gap in our knowledge of our uh, institutional cooking programs. And uh, the result is that uh, uh, cooking with uh, biomass on open fires or uh, uh, traditional stoves is uh, predominant still, uh, despite all the efforts. Um, so that's if you want the challenge, the fact that the high, the upfront cost is a bit of a barrier. Um, but the opportunity is that, uh, uh, for example, we could um, uh, look at carbon financing because uh, it's uh, relatively easier to uh, track uh, institutional programs than uh, households, uh, uh, for example. Um, we had some ambitious pilots, uh, for example, in uh, Lesotho, we introduced uh, electric pressure cookers to challenge ourselves and uh, be more aspirational in our uh, goals. So um, we are evaluating that program as well, and uh, the results, you know, the research questions were, is this something that uh, culturally is compatible with uh, what people are used to? And pre preliminary results uh, would indicate, of course, is just for schools, so uh, we need uh, much more investigation. But um, the, the, the EPCs were retained, and we are looking at the cost, the, the time saving, and uh, all the other impacts. Um, we have, um, of course, the, the um, uh, Rwanda uh, study uh, that I also wanted to, to quote because um, some achievements can be obtained through changing the technology of cooking, but also looking at the menus is very interesting, and that's uh, a study that uh, WFP has conducted in Rwanda with the MAX, um, looking at uh, both the kind of foods that are used in uh, school uh, uh, feeding programs. So for example, beans rather than lentils, uh, or uh, you know, very energy intensive ingredients rather than uh, others, or the, the beans we are famous for, the ones that are hard as rocks, um, what can be done to uh, switch to, to, to fresh beans, for example, or uh, uh, things like that, but also behavior. Uh, are people soaking the beans? Uh, are people keeping the lead uh, over the stove, etc., etc.? So um, that is uh, also. Uh, a very interesting approach, and the uh, results are encouraging in that uh, in that sense as well. Um, yeah, so I, I would say lots of opportunities. Uh, definitely sounds like lots is going on, and hopefully that will continue informing the thinking and the strategies going forward, not just for the World Food Programme, but also for other partners involved in. Um, large-scale cooking, which should not be forgotten. We tend to think about clean cooking at a household level. Uh, but there are various contexts, various scales that we really have to tackle at the same time. Um, that brings me back to you, Anita. Um, setting up commercial kitchens, uh, or a commercial kitchen, um, what interventions have you seen that have specifically impacted on boosting food security, you know, thinking about that nexus of culture, energy, and food, and food security? Um, and what kind of solutions, you know, short, medium, long term, have you seen working or not? Um, I think I would first like to mention Alex's point 
um, you know, talking about this intersection of culture as well as cooking and also thinking about the healthiness of the food. And of course, that's, we're still in the beginning, but we have a long way coming. And looking at it from a commercial viewpoint, when you're having masses of groups of people, um, you have to be able to look at a few things when it comes to what are the challenges first. One, it's, you know, you have limited human resources. So you're thinking about unemployment. You're thinking about wages. Um, you're also thinking about community resources, whether it comes to your utility bills. And then all these things come into play depending on the country. You may think about land tenure, so on and so forth. And so those, you know, you have to think about what interventions work. From a U.S. perspective, yes, we have SNAP programs, which is, you know, provides food credits to people. You know, you have different things, but then you're thinking outside of the developed world, what actually works here, right? Land tenure policies don't, may not apply everywhere. Every country is different. You know, we don't necessarily have land tenure issues here in Ghana to the magnitude of something that happens in India or somewhere else. Um, so we may think about it more so for intervention, short term, what I've seen that is actually working is that you try to provide convenience, but you also have to keep in mind inflation. And inflation is affecting everybody. And when we're thinking about clean cooking, you also have to make it um, you have to educate the community where they see that more as a benefit, the clean cooking side, as opposed to just going down to the local gas station bringing your tank and getting it done. And it's in and out, right? And so what I've seen thus far is just short term is, okay, how can people get access to healthy food? How can we get people to come and make sure it's not, not the same price, better than what you get at the market? And so what I've seen in South Africa, there's a food accelerator there called Wakanda. They started this container where it's refillable, uh, refillable dispensers. And they're helping to look, they're looking at food security that way. And so they are, they, you pay a price, you get a glass container, and if you come back with that same glass container, it's lower than if you were paying regular price. You're also seeing mobile trucks, right? Um, and then if you're thinking about, um, in the context, let's say in West Africa, you see a lot of people on the roadside who are cooking their food. They're using regular gas, you know? And so what is the short-term solution to that? Solar. Because a lot of the times there's rolling power outages. I was just saying to you this morning, I had a power outage um, at my house. So it has to be from a short and long term, if you're offering solar, is it Actually, it, yes, it's a great solution, but is it affordable? My parents have solar in the U.S. They're in their late 60s. They just got it three years ago because it was now affordable where they don't have to break the bank. And so as we think about clean cooking, as we think about these interventions, whether it's something old school where you're making it convenient like what we're doing and having people come to us, but we still have to make it affordable for people to make actually turn a profit. So as a CEO, I'm kind of in this conundrum of I have to make sure I eat, I have to make sure my staff eats, but I also have to make sure these food businesses are you know, working with their people, um, are able to feed their people, and then looking at it from, okay, then solar's an option, but is it affordable? And from an institutional level, I don't think everyone's thought about it. We always say clean cooking, we say solar, we say all these things, but to Alex's point, how can we make it affordable? You know, we also have to worry about the healthiness of this food, convincing a population, a society of people that yes, don't use gas anymore, but if someone's saying, well, my gas costs $3 a liter, and you're telling me that using solar and using clean cooking is gonna be $6, they're not gonna, that's, that, they don't see the long term. And so I think, you know, really there's several things um, that do work, but I think there's, it's still in the beginning of what that actually looks like to actually say this thing works right here because the biggest thing that everyone says is the cost. Yeah, affordability, affordability, affordability. Um, absolutely, I mean, while um, clean cooking is the sector that perhaps faces 
the highest barriers in terms of behavioral change that has to sort of come with it. Um, that cost aspect is absolutely critical. Um, from your perspective, Alex, uh, working in the private sector, providing those solutions, which address so many challenges, offer so many opportunities, but are not necessarily the most affordable to your regular farmer. And you're doing a lot in that kind of um, aspect. But I want you to link that to how that can be better plugged in to bridge that gap between energy and food security, thinking about the cost. What can we see uh, going forward in, in that space uh, from a Sistema Bio's perspective, but also being part of the private sector representation? Yeah, of course. I, I just wanted to add a little bit on this cultural change because I, I think the the idea of cooking at schools is such a powerful tool because it is really a behavior change driver. Um, one of our earliest projects in Mexico um, evolved from a group of parents that had a few of the parents had purchased our systems and they were that, that helped with the cost of their fuel at the home, but they also were responsible for bringing fuel to the school. So Mexico also has uh, food served in schools, but the government doesn't actually provide for the fuel. So the parents actually have to bring the cooking fuel in, and it was very expensive for them to do that. And so one of our very early projects was a uh, digester treating the bathroom waste from the students uh, connected to a school garden and then also providing biogas for all the cooking needs for the school so the parents association were the ones that were able to pay for that and then there was a few parents that had adopted it ahead of time but then eventually almost all the parents in the community because the kids would come home talk about it, it was so obvious they could see it working so I think these little uh, leverage points in society and, and kids and education in schools are, are one of those community points but for us to make something affordable actually it ends up being a real benefit that we can take not only the baseline conditions uh, for fuel costs but we can also take the baseline conditions for environment uh, for uh, fertilizer costs so right now we're in the middle of a, a food, sec food security crisis that everyone's aware of but the the back end of that is actually a, a chemical fertilizer crisis which is um, highly linked to that and we're not going to see the results of, to, of that until the end of this harvest season but I think it's going to really multiply uh, the impacts and what we've seen in, in uh, Mexico, India and places that really embrace the green revolution around agriculture which was this big move to chemical fertilizers and modified seeds and, and pesticides and sort of ignoring traditional practices that um, really favored biodiversity in agriculture there was this move towards you know chemical fertilizer and and when those food prices or the fertilizer prices have doubled and tripled in Mexico um, and we we had an early saying that you kind of are what you eat um, it was kind of a classic and and in Mexico most of the chemical fertilizer something on the order of 80 to 90 percent comes from Russia for example so you know these traditional farmers with their traditional seeds and practices were we're really actually consuming chemicals from from Russia within their 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 traditional practices and so we can sum the chemical fertilizer costs we can sum the LP gas or wood fuel costs or time um, and then now thanks to work that we've been able to do with with the IFC and with World Bank and and with Bix and others that we were able to explore is that we can actually put a very detailed cost on time and on human health and so I think um, then the, the, the final piece that a lot of people are talking about is now we recognize the carbon benefits as well and so our hope is that when you look at the suite of impacts that you can link back to SDGs um, and there's also this kind of X factor that's not captured which is um, always mentioned is that you know in in clean cooking sector we talk about it a little bit but it always comes out in the top three uh, benefits that people me mention which is a cleaner kitchen um, you know women speak to us about uh, community around the stove so generally speaking you would traditionally have a woman off cooking by herself and so small things that are hard to put a price on but like her husband comes into the kitchen now they're sitting around talking sort of an, an experience that we're we're used to in places that have had clean fuel for a while uh, a woman in India was explaining um, 
sort of a little bit bashfully, but about the intimacy around the smell of her hair and her clothes um, not linked to cooking. So I think what we want is to make a very rational case based on the, the return on investment. And, but at the end of the day, food, community, family, intimacy, all of these different things around health are, are emotional um, pieces. And I think that that's how you actually create behavior change, which is why it's so important to have kids championing this. It's why it's so important to have uh, unified messages from, from government and or local organizations. And why a lot of these messages have to come from the local champions so that they can not generalize the issue, but be very specific about dishes, about foods, about cooking cultures and things like that, so that um, you really incentivize and, and excite people about making the change. And, and the, the added benefit is that you save a lot of money doing it. And I like how you are sort of bringing, you know, that health aspect beyond the reduction of household air pollution. It's about the security of the food, you know, if, and, and I think this is also something that Wubet from Gain was saying in the email he sent me, um, you know, if it's not safe, it's not food. Uh, food that is improperly cooked can cause sickness. Uh, that can cause time, you know, loss, uh, resource loss, etc. It, it's it's really there's so many sort of angles to it um, that again I think we need to be talking about more and certainly kind of starting early, using schools as channels of uh, of kind of uh, education and and behavioural change is going to be very important. We have been uh, luckily uh, allocated an extra 15 minutes. So we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. So first come, first served. And I see the first hand over there, and then another one here, and then we'll see how we go, whether we'll have time for one more, but for sure two. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to speak more into the school feeding. Um, in Ghana here, we have school feeding for children, and so my organization started school gardening as part of students' extracurriculum activities. And we realized that it's most cost effective if you are able to engage the student to grow what they eat, and you also realize that a lot of times they are able to grow nutritious food for themselves because they've allocated time for extracurriculum activities and we use that most. And you realize that the traditional way is also one of the ways that they are able to adapt and relate more in terms of cost as well. So I would want to ask, how do we exchange learnings in such situations and how well can we amplify getting young people to be able to stand up to this call? Thank you. We're, we're having trouble hearing because of a crazy echo that's happening up here, but um, the question was how can you, uh, sorry, she doesn't like mic. At, how can you collaborate? You're asking how can you collaborate with other organizations to amplify the young, okay, so how can we, how can they amplify their message to get more young people involved with them doing the gardening at schools? what uh, opportunities are available, correct? Yes. Yeah, my God, because she's in Ghana. <laughs> so um, that's something that uh, WFP works on, the, the school gardens. Um, actually, there are two interesting um, attach, um, programs that are attached to the school feeding. One in the school gardens, and uh, I think the value is in the fact that the, the, the children uh, learn uh, how to care about the land uh, and uh, uh, is a demonstration uh, vehicle for the children and their parents. And the other is uh, the homegrown school feeding, so a program that aims at procuring uh, as much as possible the food locally um, and, and that, I think, has a huge impact on potentially the lives of small order farmers in, in the region where those schools are located because uh, one you know, helps them to improve the way they produce the food and uh, also because for, for us, 
to be able to buy the food locally means that the standard of production and processing and so forth is raised to international levels. At that point, those small order farmers can sell to anyone else. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something definitely that is under the radar of what we do. I don't know if I answered your question. Because yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just add to, um, just in Ghana, because from my, the hat that I wear, I work with um, a lot of food service. I work on the food service side when we look at the ag value chain, right? So I'm trying to uh, accelerate or it, you know, incubate young businesses that may need you know, um, vegetables from your school gardens. So a way to get young people involved, you're starting to see a lot of chefs who are very young, they're looking to buy their ingredients from someone. So as far as getting young people involved, you could also connect with some of the chefs locally, depending on where you're based in Ghana here. And then you'll be able to set up some type of community garden or a market where they can come and buy vegetables from you, however that looks, or to Raffaella's point, working with the families. So you can look at it from a two-prong approach. You know, and so after we're done, we can also talk more about some of the chefs that I know that may also be able to um, pick up ingredients, set up, up a cost structure and all of that to be able to get more young people involved because you're starting to see more young people uh, being concerned about how their food is prepared. And it's coming from a garden, coming from a school, so it'll be a good cause. I'm just gonna piggyback on this point a little bit because um, we, we really need to make farming cool again. And, and there has been, I think, a big error in the development sector that has broadly spun a narrative about improving incomes so that people can send their kids to school so they don't have to become farmers. And I think that that comes from this idea of like a march towards industrialization and that you know, you see uh, in the United States, we've lost approximately 98% of our farms. Um, so if, you know, less than 1% of the population is involved in agriculture in the US, and I think that has come at the detriment of rural society, uh, rural towns, and honestly the fabric of society in some ways because the farmer is, again, this link between society and the environment. And that's what agriculture is. And so when you don't have really anyone you know involved in food production, you get these food deserts and you get people that don't really understand where food comes from fundamentally. And so I think we've had this narrative where what we want for smallholder farmers is for them to earn enough money so that their kids don't have to follow in their footsteps. And I think what we strive for at Sistema Bio is to make food not only relevant, but hip and fun and cool. And so like the idea of working with chefs, we have a small farm to table restaurant that we just started in, in Mexico that's trying to explore those types of themes. And I think the school garden initiatives is one of those things where people learning that the connection for young people that are coming back and playing in soil, playing with worms, planting seeds for the first time is very powerful. And you know, obviously it links back to cooking, but at the same time, I think just broadly speaking, the importance of agriculture and having that be regionally and locally specific, I think is a, a narrative that goes against this idea that smallholder farmers are inefficient and we really have to plow everything into nice big massive rows and, and let industrial agriculture take over because I think we've shown that that's actually not a resilient food system nor is it healthy um, and, and it's actually not even that efficient. We'll take one uh, other quick question. Hi. Yes. Is, there, is there an echo? Okay. Yeah. We. I oh, you can still use the mic so I was just going to Okay. okay, still in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, hi, I'm Louise. I'm from South Africa. I've spent the last 20 years working in rural communities, specifically in schools, primary schools. Um, I designed an institutional course for South African primary schools. My question is. Can you use the mic? Oh, okay. So, my question is um, I've got an institutional cookstove for rural schools, and I've noticed that uh, a lot of European companies are putting in uh, cook stoves with chimneys, they're bottom fed rocket stoves, but in context, women have to prepare food for a thousand kids by 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, 
A lot of the schools don't have an X. They don't have a sharpener for the X. Now we want to bring in this high-tech institutional cook stove that takes a specific size of pot, plus bottom fed with a specific size of fuel. And I've been fighting for the last 10 years with a cook stove that I've got that works with 50% efficiency, is an outdoor stove, no new infrastructure is needed, is top fed for the same wood that they've got because the mamas don't have time to chop the wood. Also, it's indigenous timber which is being chopped out of the bush. There are no replanting programs. So my question is how, I'm making a voice now, sorry, I'm just a bit nervous, uh, public speaking. How do we get this voice of this innovation that we've got to call it to action without needing millions of dollars that we can roll out these projects to communities and schools and make the impact? So, and even regarding the, the food programs within schools, there's so many initiatives where you can help them start food gardens in synergy with all of these programs. But what we are often forgetting is that there are so many soft issues right at the bottom, is the amount of time that these women have, how pressured they are to cook the food. And we need to provide simple solutions that are easy to adopt as well. Thank you. Um, I'll hand it over yes. to Rafa and then we'll do this some time quick I closing remarks. <laughs> but it's a very valid yeah. question. Very quickly, I mean, that's uh, the, the, the problem that we have all the time. Um, that we tend to decide uh, and it is, is very difficult to try and influence what from, you know, I sit uh, in uh, H quarters and uh, when uh, the country offices reach out to us, uh, they normally say, well, the, the, the grant uh, expires in two months, which stove should I buy? <laughs> and I have my colleagues there, she knows very well what I mean. Uh, what we are trying to do is to say, first of all, don't even call us if you haven't done an assessment. And the assessment should look at the context, what are people using right now, and that's part of it. But the other component, what, which I can't stress enough, is to look at what kind of solutions are around in the context, because then the next problem we have is maintenance, repair, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, it, it's a matter of balancing the aspirational technology. So we obviously would like everybody to be cooking with electric, but that's not the uh, situation right now. So. Um, is it something that definitely needs to be balanced and uh, evaluated uh, each time. Thank you, Rafa. Uh, I think we're going to have to um, uh, go for a quick, quick round of final closing remarks. So I have one minute instead of two for each one of you. So just your last thoughts on, on this subject. Uh, we can start with Rafa and then Alex and um, Juanita. Last thought. Uh, um, well, I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about our effort to standardize uh, the improved cooking in uh, our, or in the, the clean cooking in our institutional programs. If we can do that, and uh, perhaps the next step is really to link uh, uh, clean cooking with the food assistance then we could reach really uh, a, a very large amount of people, 150 million last year in uh, food assistance. So that would be, uh, yeah. Thanks, I guess my closing thought is more like an, an opening thought here with the, the renewed uh, passion that we're, we're seeing around clean cooking. We, we certainly want to be an actor in that. I guess just giving it a perspective uh, where the largest biogas company in the world serving smallholder farmers um, will double the amount of systems that we've installed over the last 12 years will double that next year alone so we're in a moment of really incredible growth and I, I would say that we're you know scratching the surface would be generous right so we're, we're dealing um, with a potential for 500 million farmers that could adapt clean cooking and sustainable agriculture and you know we're still on the order of tens of thousands of farmers a year. So I think um, 
you know, right now this is maybe a bit more of a, a call to action. I think um, biogas and other systems that really do make the linkage between bioenergy and food systems and human health and climate change really do need to be at the center. And so we're really hoping that we see kind of tiered approaches where, you know, I think biogas is the most carbon negative cleanest fuel, but it can't be used everywhere. So like thinking about tiers and how these things can interact. And, and I love the synergies thinking about schools and, and other areas where high impact projects can really um, have uh, a bit more impact as we reach more people and, and create the passion and excitement around uh, what a sustainable food system paired with clean cooking would look like. Um, just as the person who's the end, um, I definitely see it as kind of a spectrum, right? We're talking about nutrition in school, we're talking about it with helping with farmers, and then I look at it from a commercial perspective. And all these things should be taken into account, and then what we're doing is that, yes, we may be working with food service establishments, but clean cooking is something that needs to be implemented on every side, especially when we're thinking about scaling up and feeding masses of people through, even if you're ordering food from Uber, ordering it from Bolt. And I think, you know, kind of a call to action is that, you know, making sure we take the responsibility, even for myself, is that educating not only the businesses but the consumers to know that if clean cooking is being used to produce your food, that there isn't a change in taste, hopefully not. Or there isn't, that doesn't mean that your food is not as as worthy as someone else who's using the, the quote unquote traditional way. And so I would say, you know, we have to continue having conversations such as this, because when we think about clean cooking, we may only think about households, we may only think about farming, but we don't think about it from a commercial scale. We don't think about how it affects children when it comes to school programming. So. I definitely would say to you all, continue to do the work that you do, but making sure that you're educating the, po the people that you work with, even if it's your family. Because we can't not make assumptions thinking everyone knows, because we learn something new every day. So. Thank you very much, and please a huge round of applause to our speakers, our panelists today. Thank you all so much. Just a quick word of housekeeping. Um, the schedule today, as you notice, has shifted a little bit, but we are pleased to announce that lunch will begin in a moment at 1.30 to 2.30 upstairs on the third floor in the Papillon restaurant, as well as on the lobby floor in the Chez Georges lounge. They're same menus, so spread out, have a walk in the garden. The next session will begin at 2.30 p.m. The schedule is updated on the online program and on the app. So please log in and check it out and enjoy your lunch. Thank you all.